became known to the Assamese as Bor County. Now, Bor is in, in Assamese great, so great county. In Western sources, they are called County Long. That is, again, great county because Thai in Thai, the word Long is paired. Two distinct meanings of the word County in the Kachin state with some 60,000 inhabitants. The old territory of the County Long lies now in the utmost north of present-day Kachin State. Their main, their main town still is Putao. So that from 1752 onwards, <coughs> this has been a Shan town. At present, it can only be reached by road in the summer for nationals, uh, but it is accessible year-round by air if there are sufficient tourists to justify a plane flight. The area around Putao is famous amongst naturalists for the variety of endemic birds and rare orchid orchids which grow naturally. Many orchid lovers are especially attracted by the black <coughs> orchid that can be found in the mountains east and west of Putao. You see snow-capped mountains, it's a beautiful region. So much for introduction. During the past two centuries, the Kamtis dispersed in several waves from this valley in the north, and that is the puzzle that I'm, I'm giving to you. When you have a found a big valley, a fertile valley, and if you manage to subject the peoples that are living around, making them to your slaves so that you don't have to work anymore and you have seven principalities why on earth would you disperse um, one group moved to Assam not long after their arrival in Borkamti Bor Bor in the area there you know, they are known usually as the Sadia counties Sadia is a place name in Assam I did field work in Assam. Maybe another time I'll, um, I can tell you something very interesting about that. In 1790, another split occurred from this central place among the Kamti Long. A group under the leadership of Tao No A sought their fortune on the upper Chintwin. Again, hundreds of kilometers away. The group that went to Assam covered a stretch of at least nine, ten days walking away. So in this contribution, I shall limit myself to the history of the original Kamti Long, and I address the possible reasons for their wide dispersal. Now, I rely upon visitors' reports, because in the Kamti Long manuscripts, I did not find any clue whatsoever. Now, the first Europeans to visit the County Longs were Lieutenants Wilcox and Burlton in 1825. Wilcox's first impression when he entered the valley were most favorable. I quote, passing through a narrow belt of jungle, we entered on a cultivated plain of a mile or more in width to us an Eden, heavenly place. And we were delighted with the appearance at the further end of a nest of comfortable houses. End of quote. He heard that the capital was a good day's journey distant. What he called the capital proved to be Manche. It wasn't the capital. What would he know? He's a visitor. He tells its inhabitants were at that time at war with the county of Mung County, another name of Bhutan. Now, this is clue number one. <coughs> counties are at war with counties. Manche and Bhutan are places about 12 kilometers apart, and they were warring. Wilkos noticed also that the major county settlements were all surrounded by a strong palisade. It's 
to win. It was, they were defending themselves. He finds these counties, an isolated group of people surrounded by, by Kachin tribes. His report reveals the presence of internecine warfare, mutual aggression, which he tells us had endured for the last 50 years, clue number two. If this information is true, it would mean that the Kamti began battling each other as soon after finding and conquering the Mali River Valley. Now, I find that a puzzling thing. I, don't, I know many Shan people, but why should they start fighting each other? And then 50 years later, still fighting each other. So that's, a, that's a, an interesting puzzle. That's where I started off. Um, Wilcox, I'm quoting, our friends had, but a few months before our arrival, suffered the loss of the larger village Moon County, which had long been their capital, and they informed us that they were now debating measures to reconquer it. Wilcox also reports that the whole valley while governed by a local Raja, a county sheep, paid tribute to a resident Burmese Pukon. What a relationship with the Burmese overlord entailed is illustrated when he writes that a list of all the presents that he had given was made so that the chiefs of other county settlements could not accuse them to the Burmese, to the overlord, of having received less than their equal share. So they're all jealous of each other. One had received presents, they all want their share. What a strange organization. His county host was also under the great under great apprehension that the Burmese, when informed of this visit by British officers, would suspect him of having invited the county to go to Assam in order to arrange the removal of them into our territories. They're thinking they're stealing, stealing people. Apparently, the county Long, as well as the Burmese overlords, had heard that the Sadia counties were doing quite fine. 1825 they were. 20 years later, there was a different story, but that's what I won't go into. The next voyager was T.T. Cooper, the British agent at Bamo. Uh, I've got a picture of, of, of Cooper. This is the time that this is the time that that uh, uh, explorers were romantic, um, brave people in the eyes of the Europeans. And I found a picture of. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, when I saw that picture, I had great, I had the feeling. Well, he dresses up like somebody who is weathering uh, the most extreme circumstances and uh, dressed up for the occasion. But it is, it is pretty weird, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that is exploring at that time. So this was T.T. This was Cooper, the British agent of Bamo. However, the Coopers <coughs> attempts to reach the Mali Valley uh, uh, where they all were come to long. It failed, nevertheless, during 1870. So now we're in 1870, we are about 50 years after the first visitors. As part of his preparation, he lived for some time in a county village in Assam. And there he reports some very strange things. The counties, he says, are divided in innumerable clans. Each clan <coughs> having its own village and chief. Each clan is recognized by the pattern of the waist cloth worn by the man. It's true, it ties in Assam. Uh, you can tell tiny difference in the weaving. But just instead of two stripes, there are two and a half stripes somewhere. So they can tell straight away he comes from this and this village. Outsiders will just see, oh, well, that's a, that's a shine. <coughs> we all have the same type of wound. 
but the, the village differences are shown. You have, I know I've seen it myself and recorded it. So that's true. I, that of Chao Sam, where he lived, um, numbered about 40 houses scattered about without any attempt of regularity. Also typical, nobody wants to be the chief. Flooring and walls consisted of closely interlaced bamboo work. We'll see that too. And the roofs are thatched with grass, the eaves projecting below the level of the floor. So you only see a big grass uh, roof. At either end of every village, county village, there is a large house set apart for, for a singular person. At the age of puberty, all the girls are sent from the house of their parents to one of these buildings. It's called the House of the Virgins. And it's reserved entirely for the dwelling place of unmarried women. From, from the time that the young girl enters this place, she never sleeps anywhere else until married. Rising at daylight in the morning, she repairs to the house of her parents, spends the day assisting in the household duties, and returns to her sleeping place with the other unmarried females at sundown. As with the girls, so with the boys. They occupy the house at the opposite end of the village. And every youth, though he spent the house in his father, the day in the house of his father, at night must return to the bachelor's sleeping place. I think it's clue number two. I think it has something to do with the internecine warfare. The virgin house is sacred. No man is supposed to enter there. Indeed, the vigilance of the old maids who have outlived the age of romance, it's not my words, <laughs> prevents any proceedings which might to be termed scandalous. Isn't that a nice way of writing it? And the morality of a county village is a pleasing contemplation. This is, <laughs> he, has a, he has a lovely style. Then he de describes the, the costume. Now, we move now to the late 19th century. So this was 1870. There's McGregor, Wood, Thorpe, Gray, and Henri of Orléans. Who come there. And both, both Wood, Thorpe, and McGregor were quick to report their findings. Um, McGregor had already um, a lecture in 1886, two years after coming back. Arriving in, uh, in our region at Lang Nu, he was warned of robbers and he was conducted to the Raja. After an amusing and satisfactory interview, they were shown over the stockade town. So the towns are still stockaded. They were told that slaves had built the stockade. In the larger stockaded town called Langdao, they met another Raja. It was then that the messengers of the Lukun, the chief Raja of the counties, invited them to the metropolis at Putao. At Putao. <laughs> Ponies were brought, muskets discharged, gongs beaten, banners and gilt umbrellas were waved overhead. And this, this ceremony has happened to myself in a county village this type of thing. Um, so, muskets discharged, gongs beaten, we know it here, um, banners and gilt umbrellas were waved overhead over trumpets also when I entered uh, a county village and they, they treated me with great honor. Um, uh, were waved overhead by an enthusiastic escort. A reception was held in their honor and the chief Raja sat cross-legged on a curiously carved wooden couch, flanked by gilt representations of dragons and covered with a crimson cloth. The valley itself, they are estimated to be 25 miles long and 12 miles wide. You see, that's, that's a pretty big valley. And it could have contained 100,000 chance for the fertile valley like that. It divided in three plateaus, Langnu, the most southern, <coughs> Manche on the northern, and Putao in the middle. The number of Kamtis they estimated to exceed 12,000, divided in 13 villages. 
the chief two villages, Putao and Manchi. The soil was very, very fertile, very large crops of rice and stored in excellent gra gra granaries. McGregor, McGregor mentions frequent blood feuds between members of different communities, again, and also that they have a, a, a fear of the surrounding sink pools. The next visitor, Errol Gray, he stayed at longest of all visitors. <coughs> He had the most deep knowledge of uh, in the best information. So, on 18th of January, 1893, the tea planter Errol Gray had an audience of the Langnau Graja. He entered the village, which was surrounded by a double palisade through a narrow gate. The palisade was 12 to 15, 14 feet high, made of split trees roughly hewn, hewn to the shape of planks and interlaced with bamboo plinths. From the entrance, no, yeah, but he describes what it looks like. You see that in the, in the article that is printed. Then he says, the Raja saw that many counties of the Lumkian caste was in the party that came with him, and that posed a difficulty. Although they were fellow shans, because the Lumkians were enemies of the Lukuns. The disunity amongst the Kamtis, remarked upon by previous explorers, is elaborated upon in his account in the Geographical Journal. He says, I quote, there is little unity amongst the Kamtis. They are split up in clans each caring for only for itself. If one village is raided by the Singpos, the neighboring county village will not help defend it. The Lukun Raja, though nominally, nominally the ruler of the whole valley, had practically little authority outside his own community. At the village of Lunkian, the headman expressed a wish to go Assam with his whole village. Noted, the whole village would come with him. In addition, Gray noted that every county village has a large extent of poppy cultivation, generally in its immediate vicinity, and that very few counties were abstainers from this drug. Two years later came Prince Henri d'Orléans. Now, that, this is Woodthorpe, yeah. Colonel Woodthorpe, here visiting the Nagas. That's the man sitting here in the middle. This is typical of the British Raj type, um, very haughty, haughty man. Um, he describes the Comte Long Valley in 1895. As far as the eye could stretch, um, could reach, were rice fields yellow as the plains of Lombardy, <laughs> a splendid territory, fertile in soil, abundant in water where tropical and temperate culture flourished side by side and the inhabitants were protected on three fronts by mountains. That they are fairly opulent was to be assumed from the silver bracelets of the children and the small silver coins used as buttons. <coughs> Indeed, Nothing would la appear to be lacking to the happiness of the people of Kamti. That's what he says. <coughs> However, he describes that the that, uh, rice granaries and the fields, and then he says, passing them, we came to the enceinte which was consisted of a stockade made of wattled bamboos 12 feet high supported in the inner face by an embankment. This palisade was armed at one third uh, and again at two thirds of its height by projecting sharpened stakes like chevaux de frise, that is a term of the, the military. It was pierced by narrow end existences closed by a gate formed of a solid balk of timber. 
where they are really strongly defended, each village. Once inside, he said that it's a muddle of, of, of dwellings and he, they look like, you know, all these long roofs made a peculiar impression <coughs> upon them. Um, he warns them against, uh, against uh, the British, uh, because at that time the British and the French were, were competing how far they would be able to extend their colonies. The French had already got into northern Vietnam and the British were <laughs> coming from Assam and this region was a contested region. It was in 1912 that a visit by Captain Pritchett took place. He arrived on the 27th of March in a county village called Kam Kyu. Pritchett's comments are more differentiated than most casual observers. He says, I quote, the Kamti Shans in their country have been eulogized by most travelers who have naturally been delighted with the people so civilized after journeys where Kachins, Kanuns, Lisus have been met with, while the country is a land flowing with milk and honey compared to the more or less barren lands that one traverses to reach it. But, regarded as a remnant of the once great and powerful Thai kingdom, the people do not impress one so favorably. They are a decaying race. The country might produce much more and a much greater variety of crops than it does. The great gold land is indeed a fertile one with great possibilities. What it most requires is a population. And then he says, an examination of the history of this race will reveal the fact that they have been, that their present marked characteristic a social disruptive tendency has always been their weak point. He says, this, its seven sh um, uh, leaders are in constant disagreement with one another and the feuds which arise from this cause are bound to effect a disruption of the whole state of Kamtilong, which it did. I mean, it's, it's now a minority in, in Kachin state. The botanist and explorer Francis, Sir Francis Kingdom Ward, a very interesting man, uh, presents an even more dismal picture of the descendants of those who conquered the valley several centuries before, isolated surrounded by trackless <coughs> mountains and by wild tribes, this outlier of the once mighty Thai race, which had spread from Tibet to the China Sea, lies dying at the source of the western Irrawaddy, for the Kamtis are slowly disappearing. <coughs> the strongest long ago emigrated to Assam, and the degraded remnant who rotted with opium, ruined by slave dealing, preyed upon by the virile Kachins are dying out. Well, it's a tragic story of uh, Sir Francis Kingdom War. <coughs> now, my conclusions, and some of them are not in the, in, in the because I am in warfare, <laughs> incessant fighting, apparently going back to the, to the very moment the county migrated up north around 1750. <coughs> This is Sir Frank Wood, botanist and author. Most impressive man when I looked him up in, uh, in the internet. That's what a county, a county house looks like if you look for it from underneath. That's in your countries. Now I've got in the internet some pictures. But uh, I wanted to show the map once more. This is County Writing. And many, I've got many scripts for you. That's a County, that's the County script. So it's, it only varies from other Shan scripts that it has these, these thick dots in it. That's a, that's a manuscript that I, I photographed uh, many, many years ago. Beautiful manuscript. Uh, it's it's sort of a 
cosmology. Mm -hmm. It takes about the various heavens. <laughs> these are these are propaganda pictures uh, from, from, from a museum. Uh, uh, lovely uh, to see. Huh? Uh, this uh, this will be for many of you. Uh, uh, I don't have to explain what it is. Mm -hmm. These dances, all chants love to dance. There you see the gong and the, and the, the drums. And, you know, they are really they are really your cousins. Maybe they come to come to among us. But here's the map. So that's, that's the one I was looking for. Um, there are countries living in Assam, here in the way away in Assam. I mean, the, this is this is hundreds of kilometers. This is the countries where the you now live. These are the singalings. So you see that they are they are dispersed. So all the all visitors noticed that they fight amongst each other. At no time in their history did they succeed to submit to make themselves into a, a, a central organization in the Mali village, in the Mali, Mali uh, Valley. This incessant internecine conflict occasionally caused large group to abandon the valley altogether. This loss of population, large group went, must have drastically weakened those who remained, leaving them open to incursions and raids from the surrounding hill peoples who had been dispossessed in the first place. And then there is the fact is excessive opium consumption that is mentioned by several visitors, which is a possibility that weakens them. Um, also, the Sadia counties were reported to be very fond of opium. But then I thought the aspect of the fact that the counties have slavery might be an might be a factor why the region didn't come to a sensible, um, a sensible organization amongst each other. How they could conflict, they couldn't, why they couldn't keep their conflicts under, under control. Um, Cooper said, slavery is an institution amongst them and well-to-do counties never labor. The men just strut about with their sword at their sides, having little more to do than hunting game, games and plotting raids. It's a possible factor, but it didn't satisfy me. And now, since I, I, I'd come this far, I looked in my own, um, my own notes. See, I was trained as an anthropologist, and many years ago I, I did field work amongst the Thai peoples, various places. Uh, I was in, in North Vietnam and in, in, in Myanmar and Laos and so on, but I, I, I spent a long time, several several times, in Assam, and that's where I met the Kamtis who lived, lived there. And I noticed when I was there that the, the Kamtis of, of the who live in Assam have a clan system. And when I inquired a little bit deeper in that clan system, which is also mentioned, as you noticed, here by the visitors over the <laughs> centuries, they are patrilineal exogamous. Now, that's typical anthropological. So they, that means that they all reckon themselves through their father's line, and all the girls who, who are married from this particular father's line, from the male line, are not allowed to marry within that clan. So they have to marry outside. And now the interesting thing is, our visitors have said that every village is a clan. So that Utau is a clan. 
and 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 Munche is a clan. And then you remember that T. T. Cooper says there is a woman's house, an unmarried virgin's house, and there is an unmarried man's house on the two sides of the village. That is an unusual thing. And can you imagine? There are these girls who walk and they are become beautiful, and there are say a hundred a hundred youths and twenty of them are of marriageable age and they are separated because they are not allowed to marry under no condition. I've I've asked the companies what would happen if uh, if you if two of the same patrilineal clan would marry? They would be put in front and they would have to eat out of a trough like animals. You know, they would they would be treated as if they they become animals. So there we are. We have got a village organization where the, in the whole village a young man cannot marry any of the beautiful women that he sees. None of them. He has to find them from somewhere else. And I found another piece of evidence in the internet. In the internet, just the other day, I didn't have time to, I just wrote it down. Uh, uh, Lila Gogoy has interviewed a county about the old history. And he says, his, his informant, Sri Chinia Gohain of the Naranpur Gohain family in Assam. He says, Lung Kang became known as a powerful chief of the region. He, however, died after a rule of a few years, when the Manches, we know Manches, fell upon Kamti Lung like wolves. They took away Lung Kang's wife, the, the chief's wife, who, the chief had died, and his widow was taken. And they subjugated Kamti Lung. And then, you know, that is part of, a, of an oral tradition. And I think that, that may be the clue why there is long-term feuding. If you steal somebody's wives, you know, you've got, a, you've got a grudge. And you steal back. And that's why you make, you make palisades so that you, your women are not being stolen. Can you imagine? And so I think I found the clue. Which, which, which explains centuries of warfare and also why whole clans move out in safety because it's no longer good to live there if you are not strong enough and you have to you are awaiting a big raid upon your uh, upon your village by your by your own relatives but they are relatives but they are not allowed you know to marry their own women. I think I think I, I, I've, I've solved a little problem, an anthropological problem, and I, I think it's new. But if you disagree, and if you say, no, I'm a county, and I know that it's not true, and so on, now tell me. Because, you know, I'm only an anthropologist. I'm an outsider trying to understand. So I ask your help in that. Professor, uh, you know, a lot of your... Uh evidence, so-called, or thoughts, are based on the reporters from outside. But what about Kamti themselves? Yeah. Did they write down anything that actually reflects what the explorer actually said? Up till now, I haven't found any comments on any of the explorers, because the Kamti selves, themselves don't read those texts. Mm -hmm. I'm the first who sort of collected them all. Every visit to the county long I found any word that has been written on it, and I would need to go and to county long. Yeah. I would need to go and talk to them and say, "What do you think of it?" Yeah. And in fact, you are serving as a as an audience because your your culture comes closest to it. I don't know whether whether any other. I think other Shan. There is one other Shan group in Assam. That also has clans, mm. but they they don't have <laughs> clans that just live in one village. They they have clans, several clans in one village, so that you could say, oh, well, this girl is not my marriageable, but that one is, and so you can start courting. Mm. 
you can get, start to get to know each other. But if they live behind a, behind a palisade, 12 kilometers away, how are you going to get a love relationship? I think that's the, it's the key to it, that you, that you, uh, that would explain why from time to time to time they move and they move way out to have no, nothing more to do there. I think so anyway. Um, you see if I've got some more on my 50. So here you see the, the, the groups in Assam. They were, they were also dispersed, but the, the dispersal of the, of the uh, Kamti groups in Assam is a story by itself. That's a military. They 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 killed a lot of British people. They were very martial. They are the most martial of the, the countries that came to uh, Assam. Were the elite. They were martial people, and the British used them and trained them, and they turned against the British. That's why they were dispersed. But that's a different story altogether. That's the one that I know better. So I, I, I went in this in the preparation for, for, for this event. Um, I hesitated because, well, it doesn't show this. I first thought I'll show them this Eden in the north. And the more I read about it, it was not a, not a real paradise that they created. And then I asked it, why didn't wasn't it a paradise? And it, I, why didn't it become a state? They had all the chances, but they, the best left in groups, large groups, hundreds and hundreds of them. <coughs> and so at present, uh, the Kamti Long is a, is a very small minority in, uh, in the Kachin state. Um, and this is the end of my presentation.